My name is Beth Wyman, Commodore of the Inland Lake Yachting Association. I'd like to welcome you back to the second webinar in our youth education series. We know that the youth fleet of the ILYA is our organization's future, and we are so excited to have back with us today, Stephanie Robel and Maggie Shea. The topic for today is starting strategy. Sit back, enjoy, and maybe take some notes along the way. It's not every day you get some rock star 2021 Olympians to share their secrets with you. Now on with the show. Thank you, Beth, and thank you everyone for taking the time to tune in with us this afternoon. Um, and a huge, huge, huge thank you to the ILYA for making this opportunity for all of us. Um, definitely missing the water right now, so this is a unique way for us all to connect and talk about sailing. So thank you to everyone who's tuning in and ILYA for, for making this happen. Um, Maggie and I are really excited to be here with you guys. Um, as Beth said, we're going to be talking about uh, starting strategy today. So um, we're excited to share some of the, the tips that we have with you guys. And we really want to welcome um, any questions or comments you guys might have along the way. Um, all right, so talking about st starting strategy this week, um, Dave Perry always said this to us in, uh, in match racing. For those of you who don't know, Dave Perry is a, a rules expert and absolute legend in match racing um, and his biggest thing in match racing was to win the start you have to be on time on the line at full speed well obviously that seems a bit obvious to all of us but you know there's a lot of tools that we can use to, to help us make that goal um, and you know we we talked about this a little bit last week but we said you know winning the start means that you have the ability to do what you want whether you want to tack or if you want to sail straight, you control the you control the area around you to make make happen what you want to happen. So to us, that's that's how you win the start. If you can master starting, then I've, then the first decision becomes a lot easier. Um, so today we're going to talk through some pre-start homework that you can have, um, where to start, um, how you make that decision because that can be kind of an overwhelming decision, um, and how to start, um, acceleration and managing your hole, all those fun tools, um, your plan B, and then the mentality of starting. Um, but as you all know, you might, you might know that feeling of like when you come off the line and you just absolutely crush the start and you're like, yeah, my life just became a lot easier. So we're gonna hopefully get you guys um, sorted with some tips and tricks to have that feeling a lot this summer. So we'll start off with um, some pre-start homework. And I know we had some questions about this last week um, on the webinar. So we just want to talk about um, the power of prep. Um, that's, that's something that Maggie and I really believe in on our team. And um, if you can get out before racing and do a lot of homework and a lot of prep, um, you'll be in a really good position um, for your race. So we actually have a pretty big list of things that we like to do, and we'll share that in just a second. Um, but it's really important to develop a routine. Um, and everyone has like a different, everyone has a different feeling of what they might want to do before the race to feel comfortable and confident. Um, and you know, it might, it's going to vary based on the different conditions that you have. Um, and we'll get to that in a second, but, um, really important things is to run the line where you want to start, um, get line sites based on your fleet's tendencies. So example in our fleet, um, when it's really windy, boats tend to set up like three to four boat lengths back from the starting line. So we would get our line sight based on that. When it's light air, we set up only about a boat length or two back from the starting line. So getting a feel for what that looks like and then also practicing your accelerations. Um, we love to practice accelerations before the start. We'll probably do at least three, probably more like six or seven, because um, you don't want to come off the starting line and have that that first acceleration be your first attempt at it. And there's, there's just a huge opportunity to gain from a really good acceleration. Um, but having a routine really helps you stay on task and it helps with nerves too. Like when I'm nervous before a race, we'll just keep going through the routine. We'll keep practicing accelerations. We'll keep practicing our line sites. We'll, um, you know, anything that can help us just to focus on the now and focus on the process, it helps a lot with the nerves. And if I could add something, I would say Steph loves this time. Like if she could be the first boat off the dock every day, she would be, but um, I'm not always ready on time. So it's usually my fault, right? Um, but this, this time for Steph is like 
I don't even know how to describe it. It's like when she gets everything in order and then is like ready to go, you know, it really, um, we found it, it seems to um, set the tone for the day and for the race. And it's, uh, yeah, so one tool we use is um, a pre-start checklist. And I took what we actually go through and then I tried to make it a little more generic. So if you wanted to print this off or copy it, you could. Um, but basically, what we mentioned on the first slide about, you know, the conditions really should determine um, how you do all these things and where you want to start should be the area that you practice in. Um, what we mean by that is like, if it's, if you want to start at the boat, then doing five pin starts isn't going to be that helpful, you know, or if it's uh, really, really windy, um, you probably don't need to set the kite five times, you know, just think about how to optimize. Well, Steph would like to set the kite five times. I do not want to put the kite up and down five times, but um, just think about how to prior, you know, spend your time in a smart way based on the conditions. And it helps like visualize the starts in those conditions. And then kind of think like, like Steph was saying, okay, it's really light. Everyone starts right up close to the line versus it's really windy. Everyone starts a little further back. Okay. So um, I'll run through these real quickly because I think they're pretty self-explanatory, but um, we have to check the boat setup and make sure we can adjust the tension of our shrouds. I don't know if you guys can, but when you do one up, one run, just make sure that you know where your controls are going to um, and you know that your rig setting is right. When I say controls, I literally look at how much Vang I pull on and how much Cunningham I pull on. I've got scales for both things, um, so I know what number I'm going to go to. That helps a lot because at 10 seconds to go, you know, or 20 seconds to go, there's so much going on. And um, you don't want to have to be looking at your bang arm going, well, how does that look? Does that look all right? What do I think about that? You know, if you just know it's going to three, boom, go to three, and that's it. Um, and also, you don't want to be messing around with the controls when you're trying to hike and go as fast as you can right off the starting line. So um, just having scales like that, and then, you know, mentally remembering where you're going to on all your sheets and your scales and your controls and stuff beforehand really helps. Um, I don't know if you guys have compass numbers, but definitely checking the angle of when you're on starboard port and when you're on port tack, um, when you're on starboard tack and when you're on port tack, um, and get a reference on shore. Think about where you're pointing if you don't have a compass. It'll help you recognize when it starts shifting around. Um, line bias, we're going to talk about in a second. Gate bias, basically the same thing as line bias. Um, practice acceleration, like Steph said. I mean, think about how many times you practice accelerations in practice. Like, when has your first one of the day ever been your best? You know, for me, it's never, ever. The first is the best. So you, you just don't want to like, just like Steph says, you don't want your first acceleration of the day to be the one that matters, right? So um, do a head to wind. That will help you check where the wind is coming from and keep an eye on what the shifts are doing. Um, Steph will tell you some techniques later for how to know what you're doing. Line sight, um, we'll talk about more of that in a second. Check the course. So this is one mistake that like, it might happen once in your sailing lifetime, but it's worth always checking. The one time that like you're the only one that remembers what the course is or remembers to check the course and it's changed and everyone sails to the wrong reach mark or doesn't do enough laps. Like the one time in your sailing lifetime that you gain points on it, I promise will make worth all the times that you checked it and it was the same. Okay. <laughs> right, Steph? Like the one time everyone's tired and makes a mistake is going to be the one time that if you're really regimented about it, you'll check it and then you get these free points. So it's worth it. Always, always, always check the course. Um, on our on our Starting line boat, they also say the, the course bearing, the compass bearing. So they put the windward mark down and then they take a compass bearing where it is. I don't know if you guys have that on yours, but um, if, that, if they do give you that direction, then keeping an eye on that also tells you what the race committee thinks is happening to the wind. Um, you know, sometimes throughout the course of the day, they'll move the mark left and they'll move it left again and they'll move it left again. Well, if they do that three times, that's a good indication that there's a persistent shift left. So checking the course, checking if there's a line bearing, where the windward mark is. Um, and then the rigging prep stuff, you know, if you, if you have kite, if you have spinnaker sheets, if your halyard needs to be run, um, for us, it's making sure that the kite is, has no water and is packed away perfectly. Um, and then checking for weeds. Steph likes to go backwards to check for weeds. Um, can you guys pull your boards up and down, Steph? What's the best way on the, on the totally. yeah, in the opti, just lift your boards up and check your rudder. Yeah, 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 cool. All right, this is, uh, Real quick though, how many of you just type yes or no in the chat? How many of you already have a pre-start checklist like this? A lot of yeses. Nice. That's awesome. awesome. And an important part about this is to, to know how long your checklist is going to take you before the start. So um, if, if it takes you 25 minutes to make your checklist happen, then you should get out 25 minutes before the race. Um, we like to leave as early as we can, hopefully between 45 minutes and an hour before the first race. Um, but 
make sure you know how long it takes you and you can always print it out and laminate it or put it in a plastic bag and put it in your life jacket so that you can refer back to it um, before the start. Cool, so there's definitely a lot to factor in when we're thinking about where to start and it can certainly be um, an, an overwhelming decision to make. Um, so we talked a little bit last week about um, you know, kind of some win strategy type things to help you make that first decision. But definitely some things to think about is um, where do you need to be to, to be set up for that first puff that's coming down. And I think that's super relevant to any sort of small lake racing that any of you guys might do because it, it does tend to be really puffy and really shifty racing. So making sure that you're set up for that first puff that's coming down, um, making sure that you're in a position to get onto the lifted tack right away. Um, this is super important again when it's really shifty, really puffy, because if, if you start out in a right phase, you know it's going to, to slowly come back to the left and then it'll go back to the right. Um, and so you want to be able to be in a position to get into phase right away, get on the lift attack. Um, and then how big, how big is the line and how big is the line bias? So that's something we'll, we'll check in a little bit, but making sure that you know how important, how big is the line bias, because that can have a big influence on, on where you might want to start. Um, and which way are you trying to go? Maybe sometime you have um, one side of the course that has a lot more wind than the other side. So you're really trying to race to get to that side of the course, or maybe there's less current on one side than the other, and you're trying to really race to that side of the course. So um, really trying to, to kind of go through this checklist um, to understand where you might want to start. Um, all right, a really great question in the Q&A about line bias, and it's exactly what we want to talk about right now. So <laughs> line bias basically means which end of the line is further upwind than the other end. Um, on inland lakes, which are generally really shifty and puffy, uh, it's almost impossible to set a perfectly square line. So a perfectly square line would mean that there's a wind coming from one direction and then and the starting line is exactly 90 degrees to that. Um, it's almost impossible and it usually changes throughout the course of the starting sequence. So we mean by bias, we mean like which end of the line is favored. That's another way to say it. Um, and, and basically just which one is a little bit closer to the winner mark and a little bit higher upwind. Um, so this diagram, I like it here because it's got a pretty subtle line bias, but that would be the pin favor. Um, and it shows that if two boats were to start at the same time, at the same speed at the boat and the pin and sail upwind, uh, the boat that started at the pin would have about a boat length and a half advantage because the pin was a little bit biased. Um, okay, a couple things that really matter here, how long the starting line is affects how much the line bias, like how big the line bias gain or loss is. So if you have a really short starting, if you have short, tiny, you know, five boat length starting line and it's a little bit skewed, it's not that big of a deal, right? Because it's only five boat lengths long. But if you have a really long one, like say you're sailing an orange bowl or there are a hundred oppies on the line or something. So you've got this really, really long starting line being off by one or two degrees over that much of distance actually has a bigger and bigger effect. So the bigger the starting line is, the more the line bias matters. Um, okay, a couple ways we check the bias. Okay, this is my favorite. We basically go head to wind and I stick my arms out <laughs> and I line them up with the chain plates and I look both ways. But there are a couple important things that we have to do here. First of all, you wanna be in the middle of the line, like close to the center as possible. Um, and you have to be directly head to wind. So I'll let Steph talk about this in a second. But basically, if you've got two people on your boat, when the, when the skipper says, okay, yeah, good, we're head to wind right now. Like on our boat, Steph looks up at the wind decks, you know, the, the wind indicator on top of the rig. She looks at the jib. Um, and when she says now, 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 or mark, 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 whenever she says that, that's when I look. And so I have to wait until we're actually really dead center head to wind. And then I like to look between um, where the shrouds that were uh, our side stays attached to the deck, these little chain plates. Um, I put my head between those two things and you can put your arms out as well. Each one's, you know, it's a 90 degrees, the center line of the boat. And then I look and see, is the committee boat above it or below my arm to the right? Is the pin above or below my arm to the left? And just like you see in this diagram, if the pin is below it, then the pin is low. And if the committee boat's above it, then the boat is favored and, and vice versa. Whichever one's above that 90 degree to your, the center line of your boat is the favored end. So Steph, can you tell us a little, some techniques for going head to wind and keeping the boat there? 
Yeah, um, just making sure you have some speed before you go head to wind. Um, if you go head to wind without any speed, it's gonna be really hard to get the boat all the way into the wind. So have some speed, get into the wind. Um, and then if you can, um, going backwards is pretty easy. But if you can just, if you can't go backwards that easily, just stick the bow into the wind. And you can almost, on your Opti, you would be able to use um, the centerboard trunk to help you understand that, um, you know, if you don't have a super handy dandy Maggie like I do, you can use your centerboard trunk. Um, or you can maybe just try letting go your tiller for a little bit and checking, but making sure that your head to wind is super important um, for this process. And the best way to check that is if you're in an Opti, you have your wind indicator, you can see it pointing straight at your stern. Or if you just have, um, if you just use your boom, if your boom's in the middle of the boat, if you have a jib, if your jib is um, smacking the, the mast, that's a really easy way to, to help you understand if you're head to wind. Um, and again, that's a really important part of, of checking this line bias. Well, one other thing I'll mention, um, it's important to make sure that there are not a bunch of boats luffing to windward of you. Um, because if you're sitting in everyone's bad air, it's gonna be hard to know exactly when you're head to wind uh, at the right time. So you kind of need clear path in front of you in order to do this. Okay. Um, so one technique, we, well, when we talk about where we wanna start, we basically divide the line into three chunks. We talk about the pin third, the middle third, and the boat third. And we like to do that because some days it's really important to be like the boat closest to the starting line or starting to the, the boat closest to the race committee boat. Some days it's, you want to be the boat right next to the pin, right? And uh, some days you don't have to be all the way to one side or the other. You know, like you can be in a pack that's in that third of the line and still get the advantage of the line bias, but maybe you're able to get a better lane and hold that lane for longer if you want to go left. So we start talking about like, is it a day that we can just start in that the third, you know, with that pack, or are we trying to be the boat at the pin? Um, so, and also a couple just thoughts about the different areas of the line. Um, the pin, the pin has some, starting at the pin has some risk involved because if you have a bad start and you need to tack out right afterwards, um, you've got more bad air to sail through before you'll get a clean, clean lane. So, if all things are equal, the pin would just have a tiny little bit more uh, risk involved. The middle we think is hard because it's harder to know um, how close you are to the starting line when you're not right next to an end. Be and we'll talk about the line tag in a second, but um, it's basically the hardest area to really judge your, your time and distance um, because you're the farthest from the two points where you know there's a line, there's a line. Um, and then the boat, there, boat would be like, kind of the safest place to start because we think that for a few reasons. I mean, one, number one, if you have a bad start, you're able to tack out sooner um, and get to clear air faster. Um, but also you're closer to the starting gun. So if you are unsure about the time, it's always good to go right up there. You can usually hear race committee counting down. Um, Unless you're in a foreign country, it might be a little bit harder, right? <laughs> yeah, true. But then you can learn, right? <laughs> We've learned. Um, yep, that's very true. And then uh, the other one is, um, if you're starting at the committee boat, you have a good sense of, you know exactly where they're calling the line from. So that's something also important to note, no matter where you're starting, um, but you just have a good a reminder of it uh, when you're right up at the boat. Okay. Cool. And I actually just got a, a little tip that um, in the IOA, we use uh, a midline boat. So that's something we'll make sure that we mention in what, as we continue forward. Oh, our... nice. Yeah, midline, if it was a midline boat, then I think you just basically, imagine having two lines next to each other, you know? Yeah. Like I think you'd have line sag for the same reason, but maybe two sections of line sag. So um, what is line sag? I wanna talk about that real quick because we keep throwing that number out, or that, that word out, term out. Um, line sag happens almost all the time and even at the highest levels. And it's, uh, it's something that if you can see it and you're confident in it, it's a huge opportunity to get a big jump on the boats around you. So um, the reason line tag happens partly is because people don't wanna be over early. And like we were saying, it's harder when you're in the middle of the line to know exactly where the line is. So they're a little hesitant to get too close, right? But um, our theory, and by the way, guys, sorry, just um, hope, can you see my cursor here stuff? Line tag is the, this, see how this is not a straight line down the, down the course. It's basically like a curved half circle. <laughs> You know, that, that's what we're talking. We would say maximum sag is like right here in the middle where the boats are the farthest away. 
sometimes where that max is, where that max tag is changes. Um, and, you know, sometimes there will be like random bulges, but line sag basically means like the line has sagged, you know, downwind basically away from where the actual starting line is. Um, okay, so this is why we think it happens. <laughs> when you line up next to a boat and um, you guys are both hanging out somewhere between like head to wind and close hauled, I think this little like um, optical illusion occurs where you think your bow is bow, you know, in line with them, but you're actually a little bit bow back. And then you have that happen 10 times over and one boat's a little further bow back and a little bow back and a little bow back. And then all of a sudden you're two boat lengths back and that's the line tag. Um, so look at these four boats on the bottom and the ones on the left, uh, I just want to point out. So that would be like if they were both head to wind with their sails laughing and they were on the starting line and they'd be bow even, right? And then now when you pivot those boats 45 degrees down, I want to point out where the bow of the windward boat is on the leeward boat. It's like almost back by where the skipper sits, right? But that's not generally where people sit when they're setting up because they think they're, that you feel exposed there. Usually I'm the crew. Usually I'm like probably where the bow of the neck, the windward boat is. And so if you look at the diagram on top that with the sagging boats, <laughs> um, the bow of the boat directly to windward of most of these boats is about where the, where the crew would sit. And so that doesn't line you up um, in a line that's parallel to the starting line. That lines, that, that basically creates a sag. So um, I wanna actually go back a couple of pictures. Yeah, so this one, those boats are all basically in line with the starting line, but you'll see that like when they turn down, it's almost one in front of the other. Um, and so I bet Sweden and France feel pretty exposed, but they're not actually in front of each other, of, you know, stacked up wind. They're like still next to each other. Um, so I just want to point out that this is a really common trend and, and knowing um, you can have your coach kind of help you out. Like, but knowing when you're next to a boat, how far forward do you need to be on that boat in order to actually be bow to bow on, on an imaginary line versus bow to bow on a line that's diverging from the starting line. Okay. High level stuff right there, Maggie. That's oh yeah, awesome. oh, yeah. optical illusion, it's like magic. <laughs> no. Um, okay, we're, we're all guilty of line sag. It always happens. That picture I showed oh, you was like gold fleet at the world championship, right? So it's everywhere. Um, and if you can be the first to spot it, you're gonna win. So, okay, line trans, so sometimes people call these transits, sometimes we'll call them line sites. I don't know any other words for it, but you can name it whatever you want. Basically, you find something on shore, and then we're gonna we're gonna look through the pin to that object on shore, and that's like a reference of where we are on the starting line um, that we can use if we can't see both ends. So I would like to start with the we sometimes we get a line site that's our on the line line site. And for this one, you want to go to windward of the committee boat and you want to look through the orange flag or wherever they're sighting down to the pin and then find something on shore that lines up with that. Um, and a couple things to remember, you could do this the opposite way, like say you've got stuff on your right hand shore, but not on your left hand shore. But it's a little bit, I, I'd find it, I find it harder to do looking through the committee boat, but it can be done. Okay, so that's your online line site. And usually on online line site to us means like, we're over, <laughs> you know, if, if I'm seeing that and we're still stationary, that's like, well, we're really, we're really close or whatever it might be. Um, then you, we have a line site this little red house would be our like one and a half back or two back or whatever that might be. Um, and that's our, you know, line site for probably where we're like hanging out and, and down speed. And then the one below that would be that tree off in the distance. And that's like four bowl lengths under. Um, and just to reiterate, Steph was asking or talking earlier about like the amount of breeze kind of tells you, you can guess like where everyone's going to be setting up and in, in heavy air, it's better to have a line site that's like four bolt lengths back. In light air, you want one that's like two bolt lengths under, and that's just because that's where you're actually gonna be waiting and have a chance to check the transit, check your line site. Um, okay, one thing that happens when you, the reason we said you wanna get line sites where you wanna start is because they change a little bit based on where you are on the starting line. Okay, so let's talk about this tree example. Um, if we, if we set up directly under the committee boat and we said the tree on the star on the, on the shoreline is three bolt lengths under, you have to know that's three bolt lengths under the line at the committee boat. 
And then if you were to go, if you were to actually start in, in the dead center of the line, then in theory, it would be one and a half boat lengths under. And I would basically say that if you got the start, if you got the transit or the line site at the committee boat, I don't usually find it helpful at the pin. Um, but you can, your online transit should work on the line still. Um, I, maybe we could stop and see if there are any questions because I think we just buzzed through a lot of information. We got one from, from Lucas. How do you do a, a line site in the ocean? <laughs> mm, that's a very good question. And <laughs> so sometimes you can get it on the opposite shore like we we're talking about. Um, but there are definitely times, we have to admit, there are definitely times you just cannot get a line site, right? Like sometimes there's no um, shoreline around you. And friendly reminder, the objects have to be stationary and permanent. They cannot be moving things, right? If it moves, then you're really going to be messed up. Um, but on those days when we don't have any line sites, I, tell, I say that to Steph, no line sites. And then our default is to match the bows around us. Um, and I would say there's kind of one caveat to that, one thing to be careful of or to know is that uh, if you kind of have a sense of in your, in your fleet, are boats over early a lot or are they very infrequently over the line early? You know, and that can kind of help you with your confidence level of matching boats around you. Um, you know, sometimes Steph and I will look at the scores and certain people will be over a lot in specific conditions, okay? And then we know that like, well, if they're poked out on the whole group, group, and I know they've had like two OCSs already this regatta, we're not gonna like match their bow, <laughs> you know? But um, then there are some boats that you know start really well. And if you don't have any transits, you can always like kind of default to being in line with the crowd and pulling the trigger at the same time or just before. And like, generally speaking, you'll be okay. Is that fair to say, Steph? Yeah, totally. And you know, the, the only other comment that I have is that maybe, you would consider starting closer to an end if you don't have a line sight. And it's, especially if it's a really big line, you could start more towards an end um, because it's just that much easier to gauge. Totally. Any more questions on what we've talked about already? If there is no line bias, where on the line do you like to start? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think that leaves it a bit more open, to be honest. and then you would just think about where is the most wind on the race course. Um, if there isn't really a difference side to side, let's say you're sailing on the ocean or Lake Michigan, um, where it's a really steady day, um, then maybe you don't have any major differences in wind side to side, or maybe you don't have any big, um, big um, shifts on the race course. So that's um, a time when you would just maybe start up where there, start where there aren't that many boats. And then that way you can just focus on locking into your speed right away. Um, and, you know, as we'll talk about in a little bit, speed's like absolutely critical coming off the line. So if you can start in an area um, where there aren't a lot of boats starting, you can um, really take advantage of, of your speed off the line. Low density, low density low start. Density. <laughs> yeah, totally. And if it's not the first start of the day, you can think about, okay, I can't tell there's a bias. I can't see any pressure differences. Well, think about what worked well the last start, you know, and where was that? And then, and check that out. Okay, cool. Um, any more questions on this topic? I don't think so. I think we're all good right now. Sweet. Just wanted to touch base a little bit on um, thoughts on final approach. So we talk about having a pre-start routine, you know, to do all this homework before we get out um, onto the race or before we start the race. Um, but then it is nice to keep things a little bit more routine oriented as you get into sequence. And so one, I, one thought is to really create a routine for your final approach to the starting line. So um, we love to hang out above the starting line. Um, it's the easiest place to see the wind on the race course. You can do head to wind readings really easily because you don't have um, boats, where you typically don't have boats um, sailing in front of you. And it's just, you can stand up in your boat, you can look up wind, you just get a really clear feeling for what's going on. So one idea is to, to kind of Position yourself above the line, maybe three or four minutes to go, maybe even a little earlier, five minutes, um, and then make your game plan. Have your game plan made four minutes at the latest if it's a really big starting line, probably more like five minutes, um, and then three minutes if it's a shorter starting line like you would have on your lake. Um, so what, you can set up in the middle of the line, okay, say we want to go to the, we want to go right up wind, and you can bear away onto port, 
and then come around the, the committee boat. Or if you want to start near the pin, you can bear away on a starboard and then jive around um, the pin end of the starting line. And this just helps to add some routine. Um, again, it's nothing that you have to do, but it's just something that we like to do, especially if we're kind of, if it's a really puffy, shifty day and we need to spend some time looking up wind and saying, yeah, first puff is going to be coming down from the right. And then we'll split off to the right hand side of the starting line and then come in an approach like that. So that approach can be a really important part of your race, of your pre-start. Um, and the important thing to think about is if you're coming in on port, um, that you have to, when you do that tack onto port, that you have some speed. If you come in really slow and go to tack onto port, it's going, you might get stuck head to wind or you might not be able to, to get up all the way to the line very easily or you might misjudge your ley line. So have some speed when you do that tack and that way you can complete it really clean um, onto starboard. Can I add, Steph, one thing I really like about that port tack approach is how easily we can see what spots are available. Yeah, you, know, you can sure. see the holes where people aren't doing a good job of managing their hole and you can kind of see who's like not paying attention. You can wipe their spot more easily, yeah. but we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah, and I think just another thing to, to note on this is that, again, if you have a big line, you're gonna have to make your game plan and decision a lot earlier because you don't wanna get stuck above the line you know, at a minute to go. So make sure that you're, you're in this, um, you're either on starboard or port below the line um, sorry, you're, that you're on starboard below the line by one minute. Um, that will be your, your final, final approach then. Hey, question, are exboats hard to bear away? Like, do you ever take, take water on when you bear away? Mm -hmm. oh, okay, never mind. Never mind. Okay. Um, okay, question time. Um, mm -hmm. We would like you to chat, to type in the chat box. Who do you not want to be here? Like, which of these four boats, and you can answer one or two boats, who do you not want to be? And maybe why, if you feel like sharing why. If you have like an emoji, I don't know if you can chat an emoji. <laughs> oh, nice, getting a lot of A's. Yeah, I like it. Is there another boat you don't really want to be here? Nice. Yeah, I love it. I guess there, I, I was a little, um, it was a little tricky that we didn't say that this is like, what, 15 seconds, 15 or 20 seconds. So like everyone is okay timing wise on their distance line. Nice, I love it. Those are a lot of really great answers. Yeah, I, I would say I don't wanna be A and D you're thinking, I don't really have a lot of space for my bow down here. So yeah, I would totally don't wanna be A and don't wanna be, don't wanna be D. And I think some, we had some Bs, but I, we kind of tricked you on that one because um, you would want to be B if it was like a minute to go and you're on the starting line, but if it's like 10 seconds or something, then B's okay. So we should put, um, yeah, we should put a, a, a time on that one. But okay, so Steph's going to talk about who's got a good hole and why and what we're looking for. Yeah, so as you guys, as all of you saw there, um, A and D are both in pretty compromised spots because they don't really have a, a gap to lure of them. Or if they do, like A has a gap, but they're maybe a little thin on ley line and they're not about even with the bo with boat B. So a really important part of, of your final approach to the starting line, when you've made that tack on the starboard or you're, you know, you're on starboard one minute to go, now you need to start focusing on managing your hole. And the whole point of having this gap to lure it of you is so that you can put the bow down, do a nice acceleration, and then after the starting line, you have a gap to lure it to sail a really nice lane after the start. So there's a lot of work that needs to go into managing your hole and you really have to, you really have to take control of the boats around you and especially that boat to windward, um, trying to create that gap to windward of you. And this, this is a time to like really step up and be aggressive and um, use your sail, your sails and your, your downspeed boat handling to really position yourself well in the boats around you. Okay, now I wanna play a, uh, this is some GPS tracking uh one of our star races in australia um we're not highlighted on here because we didn't have a perfect start but um our us usa teammates and friends did actually and so they're the red boat usa nine but i just want to point out here that these four boats so they either have space to lured or they either have good space to lured like we're talking about or brazil which is the um kind of purpley boat they're bow forward on the boats to lured so they're covering them so that was the one that it's, it turns out really well for them, but um, 
I don't think you can quite see very well on the tracker the fact that they're actually like bow forward and covering that person completely. So they all start with space to leeward and their bows are even and their bows are forward. And you can just tell, I want you guys to just watch over the next 20 seconds. They just keep, their gap keeps growing from the people that are in bad air behind them. And uh, I'm not sure if you can see, but their ranks on the thing are like, they're in the top five for sure. Um, and you can you can see they're all kind of pretty close to that leader line. But it, it was, I thought it was kind of a cool video because at 30 seconds to the start, you could look at their positioning and the same people that had a good hole at 30 seconds to start look good 30 seconds after the start. Um, and that just all comes down to like the fact that they could go fast and they could put the bow down and they could sail freely and they weren't pinching, pinching, pinching and going slow. Um, should I play that again, Steph, or are you using well, I think I think that was a really good example. Okay, cool. Yeah, they all have nice space to lure. Brazil's like basically covering that one boat, so that one looks a little bit funny, but yeah, 10 seconds to start, like, they're they're looking great there and then they're gonna look good for the next couple minutes so cool and then there's like this whole like dance that goes on in the you know final minute of the start where you have boats that are coming in trying to steal your hole and you're trying to work um work a gap to leeward and and all this stuff is going on um and it's really important that you understand how to defend if you have a good hole to leeward how you defend against that or if you don't have a good hole to leeward how you can make the most out of any opportunities. Um, so here we want you guys, so Maggie and I call anyone who is trying to, to steal our hole a shark. Um, I don't know what, you, what term you guys use, but we think it's a pretty fun term to use. So we want to hear from you guys, which boats do you think are sharks in this situation? And what are sharks gonna do? Someone's gonna steal your hole, right? Yeah. Oh, Steph, I know you're, you're holding back singing that, your favorite shark <laughs> song. Baby shark, <laughs> baby, <laughs> baby shark, <laughs> <laughs> B and E, E, H, B and E, H. Nice. Good answers here, you guys. E and H, H, B. Nice. Uh, Maggie, would you like to reveal the answers? At e, <laughs> H and B. Nice. <laughs> so those are the sharks coming in here. Um, again, that's just a term we use. Other people would say pirates. Um, I don't know if you guys have any other terms. Feel free to type them into the chat. Oh but, yeah, I want to see what you call them. Do tell us. <laughs> um, but we can. You can also say offensive defense. So any boats um, coming in to steal a hole H E and B um, are on offense, trying to steal a hole, and the other boats are on defense. So um, one, you know, one important part of of managing this gap is that you um, you have eyes going around you all the time. So if you're boat A, for example, you have this really nice gap to leeward. Chances are someone's get, someone else is gonna be eyeing it, like boat B. So making sure that you have your head on a swivel um, to understand who might be coming in to, to steal your hole um, and how, how you can defend against that. So one way is to, to put your bow down and, say, and try, to try to take up space in your hole. Um, you can see boat D, for example, um, puts their bow down to, to force um, boat E or shark E to make a decision on whether they're going to sail behind them or tack really thin on the hip of boat F, which would be a really hard position to start in. Um, so as soon as you see someone coming in on port who might be trying to take your hole, you can put your bow down at them. Um, again, remember though, if you, if you come down, if you change your course as a right of way boat, you do have to give them room to keep clear. So, it's just more of a defensive tactic that you put your bow down just a little bit, um, take up some space um, and say, hey, I'm on starboard. Um, and then maybe boat E will keep going and try to take boat A's gap. Um, does anyone have any add, Yeah, I wanna add one thing. So as a crew on the boat, sometimes basically when Steph is holding the main sheet and sculling, it's impossible for her because she doesn't have eyes on the back of her head, although I think she thinks she does sometimes. No, I'm kidding, but you, like every day, skippers have a blind spot, right? Like there's always like some spot that they can't see if they're holding on to two things with both hands. And then as a crew, like that spot is your job, right? Like I know that Steph cannot see anyone coming from that specific area. And so it's my job to say something. And so, um, yeah, sometimes I'll say shark, 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 whatever, but um, it also works really well if you point at that boat, like you, I'll literally point at the boat that's trying to come in there and then Steph knows exactly where they are 
but they know that we know that they're trying to come into our hall, you know? And so I don't love like yelling, you know, don't go in there, don't go in there. Cause if someone yells it at me and there's plenty of room, I'm like, I'm going in, whatever, you know? Um, but if you see that someone's pointing at you and they're, they're basically saying, you know, communicating non-verbally, we're going to make this hard for you. We see you and we don't want you to go in there, you know? And so that's, I really like pointing for stuff instead of screaming. <laughs> All right. So another little fun group activity we have, um, we just wanted to bring to light, like some of the thoughts you might have as, a, as different boats in different scenarios at 30 seconds to go. So let's go ahead. Do we want to go in order, Maggie, from left to eight, start, start with H. So we'd like you to chat in the chat box what you'd be thinking if you were boat H. H is all the way down the pin. Um, and yeah, we've got a pretty specific order here. So if you're boat H, what's going through your head? I put those dotted lines to show the ley lines this time. And this is at 30 seconds to go. What do we have? We've got a double tack. Ooh, yeah. God, need to get out of here now. <laughs> yeah. Tack. Double tack. I would double say we agree. Bill. Oh, sorry guys, I revealed two of them. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. oh, all right. So, okay, so we wanted you to think about boat F next, um, but we were thinking that the boat F would be going, uh-oh, I need some space. I don't have any space to lured. Um, but tell us, what would you, what are your options if you are boat F? What could you do? I don't, I really, I'm curious because in our boat, we can do this move called crabbing and it's not necessarily, like there's a way to do it that's legal but in some boats, crabbing is illegal. So I think it's pretty specific. Like if you're an ex-boat, can you back on your main and move to windward at all and move sideways? Does that work? Let's see what they've got. I think, yeah, just to reiterate the point for boat H2 is um, you either, you're either bailing out by, by jiving around. It's really, really important to have that skill or you can double tack. I would say the double tack is a little bit risky at 30 seconds, especially given how thin you are on ley line. Um, because as soon as you start going for that double tack, boat G might put their bow down and say, no, 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 I'm on starboard. And you might not be able to complete your tack back to be on ley line. So um, bail would probably be the best option. Um, and we have an answer for boat F, um, sheet in and carve apart. And I think that's that's a really good move is you can kind of put the bow down a little bit, get some speed, sheet in, and then carve up really hard and create that gap to lure. We call that gapping up on our boat. I think it would work well in like a laser as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. Cool. Um, on to boat D. What are you guys thinking if you're boat D in this situation? Any answers? Stay cool. Stay cool. I like that. That's Sorry. perfect. <laughs> I'm going to remember that. I'm going to say that to you, Steph. Be <laughs> cool. Just stay cool back there. Thank you, Avery and Mason. <laughs> stay where you are. Sail backwards a little bit. Mm, yeah. Watching E and making sure I don't get too close to the line from Ellie. Nice. Thanks. Cool. Hold your spot. Yeah, I think obviously in the picture, it's a little bit hard to tell how close actually D is to the line. Um, but if you're 30 seconds and you're within a quarter boat length to the line, you're probably a little bit close. So um, it's hard. It's actually hard to back up at 30 seconds too. So staying cool is probably a good option. And just remembering that you have to pull, pull the trigger to accelerate a little bit late. Um, if you're in that position that close to the line that early, it means that you did something, um, something wrong a little bit earlier on in the sequence. So staying cool, I think is a, is a really good way to put it and, and do a late trigger pull for your acceleration. Cool. Um, all right. What about boat G? What are you guys thinking about boat G? I feel like we need some Jeopardy music playing. <laughs> yeah, I hope this doesn't feel too much like homework time. <laughs> I hope this isn't fun then. <laughs> speed. Speed, nice. Yeah, because they're kind of far back. Keep your position. Control the windward boat, nice. Yeah, exactly. That's a really good one. Head up. Make sure I can make ley line. Make sure to accelerate before F. Nice, you guys are killing it. Really good answers. Yeah, so important to recognize there is boat G that boat H isn't going to make that ley line. And so make sure you keep control of that boat F like you guys said, and then um, have good time and distance to the starting line and, and really 
be aware of where that ley line is for you because you don't want to be caught being like boat H at 10 seconds to go. Yeah, and be careful of boat H as well. Keep an eye on them because sometimes people do crazy things and they'll like tack. <laughs> they'll be totally in denial and then they'll just try to start head to wind basically and they fall into the boat and attack. You know, just be careful of them. Like sometimes you might be good on pin ley line, but are you also good on boat H ley line? You know, so just thought. <laughs> All righty, boat, boat E up next. What are you guys thinking? Sail fast. Nice, Sophie and Tilly say sail fast. Get to the line, get closer to the line, accelerate. Nice, really good, go, yeah. Good answers, you guys. I really hope this summer also, you guys are like, we're in the maximum line sag right now. We have to move forward, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, those are good answers. If you're boat E, you're thinking, I'm bow back on all these boats around me, I'm, I'm going to be late. So can't see either end of the starting line, can't, you know, you can't see in front of the bows of these boats. You got to get going forward. Those are really good answers. Cool. Um, up next, boat C. What are you thinking is boat C? What are we doing? Okay. <laughs> good. Good on us, C, Lucas. Cool. Duck, duck and shark. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do the shark. Do the shark. Get moving. Really good. Yeah. Could be covered by D. You have no room. Yeah. Exactly. You have no room in that situation. You, have, you don't have a lane to lure. So you're trying to look at your options to bail out. Maybe you have room below boat D. Um, maybe something, you know, if E gets its act together in time and goes forward a little bit more, you can maybe go under boat E. Um, the other option is to just bail out. And we call it, when you have to bail out, you call it going against the grain. So you would exit on port um, and go against the grain of the fleet. Like Maggie said earlier, it's easier to see gaps on the starting line that way. So you can bail out on the port, see any gaps. In this case, not a ton of room to the starboard end of the line. And you might just have to start a little bit late at the boat end. Um, but you know, as soon as you're in this situation, your head should just be on a swivel. Like, where is my next spot? Where can I go? Where do I have to duck and tack? Is there room above boat A? Or am I going down below boat D? Can I get, is E getting its act together? Can I boat go below them? Um, and, you're really just immediately recognizing it because you definitely don't want to be starting in this position. Cool. Um, and on to boat B, what are you guys thinking? Stay where you are, good position, head up, you have a nice spot. Yeah, totally. Boat B is in a really good position here. They have good distance to the line. They're in control of boat A um, and they, they're in the perfect spot. So you're just trying to stay cool there. Um, and they're similar for boat A. I think boat A is in a, in a happy spot, um, you know, decent gap to lure it. If they can make it any more better, um, they can. Just making sure that they match the acceleration of boat B. I, the only point I'd like to make is that w when you do have a good spot, it's nice to say that because it helps the nerves, right? To say like, good position here. I'm just trying to hold this. We're in a good, good spot. Totally. Cool. Um, and so, you know, we kind of get into this, the final like 10, 15 seconds of the race and we start thinking about that acceleration. What's your distance to the line? Are you bow even with the boats around you? Um, you know, start thinking about getting your boat down to a close reach angle to start that acceleration process. Um, and then really use the sails to help you. Um, if, you if you've been really slow in the water and then you bear away and you pull your sails onto a, a close hauled course, chances are you're gonna maybe go sideways. So get down to that close reach angle and then slowly start bringing in your sails, slowly attaching more and more speed to the boat and then matching your sails um, as you gain more and more speed. Um, and then a skipper is really nailing down that hand over hand sheeting for your acceleration. Um, that's something you guys can practice as, you, as soon as you can get back on the water is that hand over hand sheeting um, to make sure you're driving really straight with one hand and um, building speed and trimming in and then turn a nice smooth turn up at the end. One thing I wanted to bring to everyone's attention is um, how, how with a shift change, how your distance to the line changes. So let's say here, you know, you have a left shift um, or a pin end favored start and you can see like your actual distance um, to windward to the line is quite short, but the distance to sail to the line becomes a lot longer in a left shift. So if you have a left shift, immediately start thinking, I have, to, I have to get going sooner. I have a lot more distance to sail to the line. Um, you can see how the ley lines here, the red lines, create a really narrow um, starting line box for you. 
So you have to set up closer to the line, but you're, even though you're closer to the line, your, sit, your distance that you have to actually sail to get to the line is a lot longer in a left shift. And can I also make the point that it's sailing upwind on a close haul? Yeah. Right? Like the pin is almost upwind of you. So you're sailing close hauled, whereas if it was a square line, it'd be more of like a reach. And we all know you go faster on a reach than you do close hauled usually. Um, and so the time that really affects your timing often we'll say like it's a left shift. So add time or go earlier because you're sailing close hauled. You didn't have this big reach build, you know, you're not going very fast. And so, yeah, I just wanted to point that out and the opposite would be Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> right shift. So right shift um, or boat favored starting line, it's a lot easier to close that distance to the line. So if you recognize a right shift in the start, just remember, hey, I might need to pump the brakes a little bit here and, and not be as eager to pull the trigger. Um, you can see um, the distance to the line is a lot shorter um, with a right shift and starting on port becomes a lot harder as well. Um, so it's really, remember, right shift is a lot easier to eat up distance to the line. And something you can do to help you understand shifts during the start is when you, when you, tack, when you make that final approach on starboard, just take note of where your bow is lined up with anything on shore. And then if it changes um, throughout the sequence, then maybe you're experiencing a shift. Hey, Steph, I have a question for you. So yeah. in this diagram, what if there was a big bunch of boats hanging out to windward of the race committee boat? waiting to start late like would they have any how, how would that go for them that's a that's a really tough position to be in you really don't have any rights there so you would have to wait for boat a to accelerate um, in order to have your space to go in there and especially if it's a right shift yeah. boat a just needs to like basically start moving forward and then close it'll close the door so easily on you um and that that space is not going to open up so Cool. So this is just a little bit of a timeline, um, just kind of to put it all together, what we've been talking about. So at five minutes, you can be at the race committee boat, get the time, check the course and the compass, like Maggie talked about, check your, your transit or your line sight, and then make a final call on, on your rig and your control settings. Um, then four minutes, you can get your prep flag signal. I know in the IOA, there's often a boat um, to windward that has that, inf that, has that information. Um, so maybe you're not at the boat at four minutes. Maybe you're trying to be closer to the, um, to the gunboat that has the, the signals going for you. And then you can check the angle of the line. You can sail down the line, get a head to wind angle, check the bias again. Um, and then three minutes, like we said, hanging out above the starting line, checking, looking up wind, checking what's going on, discussing a game plan with your teammate if you have one, um, and then remind yourself of the priorities for the day, which we talked about last week. Um, so if it's a shifty day, making sure you're getting into phase right away. If it's um, a really puffy day, finding that first puff coming down. If it's a pretty steady day, making sure you have um, good boat speed, all that good stuff. So three minutes, make that final game plan, then split off, um, and then come back at one minute, making sure you're on starboard by one minute approaching the line. I'm starting to work that hole. Um, and then 30 seconds, this is, there's a lot that goes on in the final 30 seconds of the start, thinking about where is our bow? Am I bow even with the boats around me? Can I, can I see both ends of the line? Um, how is our gap to leeward? Do I need to do anything to change that? Um, and then 20 seconds, looking at the pressure that you're going to have for the start. Is it going to be a really big puff? Do I need to be hiking really hard? Or is it going to be a really big lull and I need to be super smooth on my acceleration? Um, and making sure that you're keeping at least bow even if not a little bit bow out at this point um, and then 15 seconds start thinking about your go time if you don't know where the line is match the boats around you um, and take the opportunity to listen for any ratchet blocks or watch the angle of the winter boat changing um, and really focus in on that go time um, and having your acceleration really really dialed in because you've done all your pre-start homework <laughs> and i kind of want to make a couple points here that as a crew, so I'm calling time, I manage a stopwatch. One thing that's really helped me is getting a beeping watch. There are these like Ron Stan clear start watches, or I think Gil makes one and Sunto makes one, but anyhow, it beeps every minute and every, then under a minute it beeps every 10 seconds, and then under 15 seconds it beeps every second. And I like that a lot because sometimes when I'm nervous, I'll count, I'll count quickly. And I'll be like, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. You know, no, that was actually off. And then the gun will go five seconds later. 
Um, and especially if you're single-handed on a boat, I think the beeping watch helps a lot, a lot. So just think totally. about that. What's up? Yeah, definitely. I use that in lasers and opties for sure. Yeah, that one's sweet. Um, and then the other thing I was going to mention is that as a crew, if I know it's a really puffy, crazy day, I'll have more check-ins. I'll remember, I'll, maybe I'll say like every minute, I'll be like, still, still want to go right, still thinking right, still want to go left, still thinking left, you know, and just use those like time marks as reminders to like check in with your game plan if it's a little more important. Um, okay, oh, and one other point is that the few, in the first few minutes of the sequence, you're thinking big picture, right? You're looking up the course, you're gathering information, you're thinking about what side you want to go to, where you're going to start. And then in that last minute, like you've made all those decisions. The only thing that matters is the boats around you, right? You're not gonna like bail and go to the other side of the line at 30 seconds usually, right? Like usually having a good start, actually you full focus on the couple boats around you, you're racing that pack from that point on. And uh, you should kind of zoom in and put the blinders on for a minute. Um, and putting those blinders on gets into our next point about lane management after the start because We've just done so much homework, so much practice, so much work managing this perfect hole. And then we practice our accelerations a million times. We have awesome acceleration and all that is really good and great and sweet. But if you can't sail really well, right off the starting line for the first like minute or two, none of it matters, right? Like, it, you know, it just kind of all goes to waste. So we think that practicing that like very precise and accurate moding so how you hike, how you trim, how you steer right off the starting line is really, really important. Um, we actually do a lot of drills where we just practice starting and then full focus on speed, 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 speed for two minutes. And um, a couple things that help do that, we don't want to be fidgeting around. You know, we want to have the control set and then not touch them again. Just go full focus on speed. If you've got marks on your sheets, go to your mark on your sheet and then don't mess around with it again. Because for us, it means that we're not fully hiking. Every little bit of hiking matters in that time right off the starting line. Um, yeah, Steph, do you want to add anything to that? Um, just let's bring the attention to the photo on the right here about what it really means to be in bad air. Um, if you start to leeward of a boat and you're not bow even, you're, at, you're going to be in bad air. If you're really tight on the hip of a, of a boat to leeward of you, it's, it's, you're not exactly in bad air, but you're in a, like a backwinded zone and it becomes really hard to hold your lane. So, if after the start, if you're having trouble going fast, or if there's boats starting to creep out to be more bow out on you, then you're going to start looking for options on how to bail out of there. Um, this is a, this like Maggie said, if you've done all this hard work up to this point, it's you know executing the really good start means that you you can manage your lane well after the start. And I want to touch real quickly on mentality because. A lot of people, and like we will admit that this is one of the most nerve wracking parts of the start, right? Like this is when you feel your heart beating and you feel yourself get nervous and you have the butterflies. And part of it's also because you're kind of have to sit stationary for a little while, you know, and like you can start thinking about these things. But um, a couple pointers about the starting mentality um, because we have dealt with this and we've been working on it for a while. Uh, we, um, you know, for a while we noticed we have the technical skills to have good starts, right? Our accelerations were good, our boat speed was good, our hole would look good, but we realized that I was getting nervous and I was afraid we were going to be over early. And so I was saying things to Steph like, don't be over. I don't know where the line is. Don't go forward. You know, and I was literally saying those things and the information she's getting then is like, you know, it's basically someone being like, be careful, be careful, be careful. You know, you can't perform if someone's sitting in your ear going, be careful, be careful, don't be over, don't screw this up, you know. Um, and so I really had to change my communication to say things like, I can't see the transits, so we're going off bows. You know, that would be a way, if, instead of thinking, I can't see the transits, oh no, don't be over early, or I can't see either end of the line, oh no. Change it to a proactive thing where you say, I can't see either end of the line, or I can't see my line sights, so we have to go off bows. Or, like you guys were saying, if you're that boat that's way back in the middle, we have to sail forward a little bit until I can see the ends again. Um, but a couple of things that helped us do that, we had to divide up who was doing what, and that was important. So I became in charge of how far we were from the starting line, and Steph became in charge of making sure we had a good hole, you know, like a space to lure it and bow out on the boat to windward. And so we were each in charge of different things, and we broke it down into like small little tasks, and it became more clear who was responsible for what, and we felt like we could work on those specific skills and we actually made a lot of progress on that. Um, and the reason I wanna mention that like, so I've heard coaches say, if you don't get an OCS every six races, you're not pushing the line. Were you told that too, Steph? Is it every six races? 
Wow, I've never, I've never been told oh, that. Oh, I've been told that by like a couple coaches. They're like, we don't. But I think that the moral of that story is if you don't have an OCS every once in a while, you're not pushing the line hard enough. Like yeah. having an OCS is okay. That's why we have drop races, right? Like I, I, I had to get over this myself and then realize like actually what's worse is to start behind the fleet every single start. Because when you do that, you start second guessing your speed. You second guess your tactics. You start thinking oh, the boat just doesn't feel right. I couldn't make any good decisions, you know, and all those thoughts like really affect your confidence levels. Um, and it's sort of, it's this downward spiral. And then you're, you know, you, you think you're not sailing well and then you start badly again and then it all happens again. So we had to make sure, really sure to not question our speed and tactics if we had a bad start. Because if you have a bad start, you don't get to make your own decisions. You know, we saw in the, pic, in the video with the boat sailing off the starting line, we saw the, how much their speed suffered if, they, if a boat started and didn't have any room to lure. They're not slow sailors. They're not bad at sailing the boat. They just are not in a position to sail the boat fast there, right? And so having bad starts over and over and over again really does start to affect your confidence. And so um, it's at, we have found it's better to get an OCS occasionally and learn how to push the line than it is to be afraid of being over and starting behind everyone over and over again. So that's, yeah. Um, yeah, and even though sometimes you have, um, in our classes, we have uh, often a, a Z flag or a U flag or a black flag. So if you're over, you're out. Um, you know, there is the, the option for the race committee to do an I flag where you can round the starting line. And, you know, that gives you a little bit more of a chance if you are over, but you still have to spend a lot of energy grinding back. So, um, you know, really having, not having a fear of being over the line, but also being able to understand where the line is. It's, it's, it's a fine line to walk for the line. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I also think you guys have, um, sometimes there are opportunities if you're over early, maybe ask um, a very nice race committee gal, uh, how far over were you? When were you over? You know, I think there'll be some regattas that they're, that I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth, but that that might be appropriate. You know, some regattas that are more practice oriented, like, ask your coach or ask the race company, hey, what point was I over? If you don't think you're over, you know, or ask if anyone has video of it, that's really helpful too. And then you can identify because with your eye flag, you could be over at like 45 seconds, right? And then you could, you could be over at 45 seconds and then go back down under the line and then start perfectly, you know, um, but you want to know, were you over at 45 or were you over at zero, you know, or three? Cool. Um, <laughs> Well, we just want, that's the end of our, our chat, but we wanted to open it up to all of you guys for some questions. Um, we actually have one in the Q and A waiting from Avery and Mason. Um, when you have a bad start and you need to do a clearing tack, when is the best time to tack back? Um, I think it's all about when you have a clean lane, to be honest. Um, definitely finding, finding the right opportunity to do that tack and, um, it's often a move of dipping down and then tacking behind a boat um, so that you can have a clean lane um, and making sure that, you know, if other boats have also had a, had a bad start that they've, you know, maybe started doing their tack out too, because if you do your bail and then you have to duck a bunch of boats, that could be really ugly and you could get tacked on again. So um, making sure you're, you're, when you do go to tack that you have um, a clean lane on, on that port tack for a while. Um, and one and other thing to look out for if you have a bad start and you need to tack, um, keep an eye on the boats that are on port tack ducking you, because if a boat has altered their course and they're ducking you, or if any boat is maybe not even altering their course and just sailing fluid of you, if you tack and while you're still tacking, they have to avoid you, then you have fouled them. So you want to make sure that you're not going to start your tack and be in anyone's way while you're tacking. So you, you kind of need to let, if a boat has started ducking you, you kind of let them duck and then tack, um, but you don't want to be tacking on their hips. So Cruz, that's a really great time for you to help your skipper out and keep an eye on boats to leeward. Um, and, and sometimes I'll say like, you can go after that boat or you can go after Denmark, you can go after boats, you know, whatever it might be. Um, or whoever's kind of focusing on driving, keep an eye on the boats behind you. And when Steph and I are talking about tacking out there, instead of, if we have a boat that's like pinning us and preventing us from tacking, instead of saying, no, you can't tack Steph, don't tack, don't tack, I would say, you can tack and duck or dip and tack, you know, like just mention that there's a boat there and the skipper has to look and see how far you're going to have to dip in the tack. 
What I do you want to say, guys? Thanks so much for using the chat. It's really fun for us to yeah. interact this much. Cool. We have a question from Jude. Um, what do you do when coming in hot on a weird docking scenario? I actually have a really bad story from docking. <laughs> I have a pretty bad scar on my shin from a bad docking. Yeah, you can tell us what not to do. <laughs> I can definitely tell you what not to do. But um, yeah, down, boat speed control is very, very, very important when you're coming into a dock and understanding which way the wind is blowing onto the dock. Um, so if you generally want to put yourself in a position so you can approach the dock coming upwind. Um, so like our dock on Lake Bula, we had a T at the end, so you could easily um, come in at all different angles. So coming upwind to the dock is generally the easiest or on a close hauled angle. That's definitely the easiest. If you need to come in downwind, um, I think you'd want to do it with your sail down or on its way down. And one thing to remember about docking is there's no rush. You can always go back and try it again, right? Like we've damaged our boat because we thought, it, you, you get this feeling like we have to, have to nail it. You know, just remember you can keep speed up, tack away and start again, no problems. Did you tell us what, what not to do stuff? <laughs> we can save that one for another day. Um, don't, you know, it's important. Don't try to stop, don't, don't put your body parts between the boat and the dock. Yes, I made a bad mistake with, uh, I think I was saying with Ann, Porter and Katie Porter on a sea boat and I we were coming in pretty hot to the dock and um, we were rushing because a storm was coming and I put my leg out to try to stop us and we came in really hard and I hit my shin on a pier post and just like sliced my shin open. I had you could see that you could see okay, my bone. Okay. I had like 17 internal and external stitches. So do not put your body parts out to save the boat. <laughs> yeah, okay, that was more graphic than I was really hoping for. It looks like a shark bit stuff's shin. But the point I want to make and I want you guys to remember is that fiberglass is easy to fix. Body parts and bones are not. So <laughs> don't ever sacrifice your body parts for a docking scenario. You know, just start over. <laughs> Lucas says, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> cool. We have one more question from Avery and Mason. Um, when the pin is favored and everyone is at the pin, would it be safer to try and get a spot in the clump or start by the boat? Um, and I think this goes back, your, your first question to ask is how long is the starting line? So if the pin is really, really favored and you have a long starting line, then you probably want to try to take advantage of that pin end because would be a lot of distance lost if you started near the committee boat when it's not super favored. Um, but at the same time, it's a little bit higher risk to start near the pin because you're in that clump. So um, actually one option we would look into um, in the 49er is starting on port there. So you could let everyone kind of clump up at the pin and then you could start on port and duck everyone so you're starting even with them, which is an option. Or you could start maybe just, just to windward of that clump, um, but with a nice gap to leeward so that, you know, they're all going slow, trying to make the pin end. You have a nice lane to leeward to, to rumble over the top of them. And one other idea, if you know, if that keeps happening throughout the day, because sometimes like we've sailed regattas where everyone wants to go right all three or four races that day. And so we know we have to be one of the first boats at the committee boat at like five minutes. You know, so when, when our warning flag goes up, which is like two minutes for five or five minutes for five or something, we try to set up like at the committee boat at that point and just hold our spot. And usually that's in light air, but um, yeah, if you, if you think you have to be that boat at the boat or that boat at the pin, then just try to beat everyone to it. And you'd be surprised how, um, how, how, how long you can hold that spot, you know? And, and if you're there already, people are like, okay, they already have the boat and I'm not going to go there. So. And also if you guys are on Facebook or Instagram, we'd really appreciate if you could follow along. We'd love to have you guys cheering for us on our journey to Tokyo 2021. Thank you, Maggie and Steph. That was great information and you gave us some great tips that'll make us better sailors and certainly give us an edge up on the competition. Thank you again to the sponsors, the organizers, and the presenters, and thank the viewers for joining us. Check out ilya.org for information on the next event. We appreciate your participation and we look forward to seeing you at the next one.